You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident panelist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore data. So, um, obviously right now, everything, it's, it seems as though the NFL has kind of just stopped. Not just the game has been postponed. It, it really just feels like, and, and I'm, I'm not saying I anticipate games being canceled this week. I'm just saying it doesn't feel like it's restarted yet. And I don't know where players are at. You know, I, I remember there was a period of time when concussion, the, the concussion issue had kind of risen to the top and it became a real serious concern and players dropped out of the NFL. There was that, I think he was a Badger linebacker, very, very good football player, very, very promising. And he said, you know, my health is more important. And he walked away from an unbelievable opportunity and amount of money because he just said, this is, it's too scary. I'm not doing this. I'm not going to risk my health. It, it, honestly, it might have been ac- after the... Uh, Horrible injury of who's the Steelers player? Oh, Shazier. Shazier. Um, that might have been the thing that rattled people. I, I can't exactly remember if it was that or the the. It might have been a combination of everything. But uh, the point is, a lot of players became introspective, and it makes you wonder how this is going to impact people, especially the players that were on the field at the time, to see it firsthand and to realize, you know, especially as people are saying, and I, and I I'm going to do everything I can to to offer zero speculation. I don't care who you are or what you think. You know, you put MD next to your name, I have no idea if you actually know what happened, but the potential that maybe a a blow to your heart could cause this. I mean, it's it's scary for just an average person. Like, you know, one of my kids jump on my chest or something. Like, I don't know. Like, how, how blunt of a force does it have to be? But to be a football player, all you do is have people slam into your chest. Especially the way this is coached. You can't go low, you can't go high. Everything just needs to be right in the chest. It's scary. Scary for everybody. I'm just sitting down here, just staring at my television or my computer monitor, just in disbelief. Not embarrassed to say I was sitting here trying to figure out if I can do the podcast as I got, you know, tears coming down my face. This is a big deal, man. For a lot of reasons, and not just because, you know, a guy is, is in serious condition causes a lot of introspection for a lot of people for a lot of reasons. And that goes for me too as a as a podcaster, especially one who revels in just trashing people. You know, this whole week was going to be just trashing Vikings fans and Vikings players and everything else and I, I, the the intention is still to do that, but it just it it makes you pause and just reflect on some stuff. I think the biggest thing in that moment is it, it just makes you care about people. You know, when, when football goes away, you know, when, when football is the only thing that matters, you can get really heated and really intense in, these, in arguing things that really don't matter. I mean, you physically get angry with like a Vikings or Bears fan because you're in this argument about something so stupid. And a thing like this just strips away all the stupid and all you see is a person there. Unfortunately, for most of us, we realize I actually do have a heart and I do care about people. I didn't realize I did, but suddenly you do. And the last thing you want to do is start tearing down people. The last thing I want is for my last words, and I'm not implying anything happened. I don't have any news about tomorrow. I'm just saying the last thing I would want is for my parting words for a player for their last time here is to call them trash. And then something happens. It's my favorite word to describe a player that I don't think is very good. And again, I've been very clear in stating that there there is a a very it's not a fine line, it is a very defined line between football and non-football. And and you know, for example, public enemy number 1 on this podcast Justin Fields. I've made it my mission to correct the error that he is a superstar quarterback because he runs fast. And I have done that bluntly and in no uncertain terms. And I've also made it very very clear that I have no ill will toward him as a human being. He seems to me to be a very, very good person. And I absolutely want the best for him. And I said that about Trubisky also when he was here. And I genuinely mean that. But still, even knowing that, even stating that and saying that, even, even 
acknowledging that a lot of this is just silliness and nonsense and we're just having fun and it's locker room talk and, and whatever, it still wouldn't be great. I mean, I'm, I, I transcribe these podcasts. I'm, I'm almost scared to go type in DeMar Hamlin or, or, or something to try to find if I've ever referenced him. Because, you know, I talk about everybody. We play the Bills and I go through the, the roster and who knows, it, it's possible I went through and go, you know, and there's DeMar and, and that guy's trash and don't have to worry about it. You know, I don't know. Maybe I didn't. Maybe I said he's very good. I, I, I don't want to have to have found that. The only time that was in the almost 1,700 episodes on this podcast that I mentioned Damar Hamlin is to uh, treat him unkindly. I don't want to know that. And so I'm not going to look it up. But again, it just makes you think. And I don't know what it means going forward. And again, I'm, I'm not going to suddenly just turn this into I love everybody because there's no point in having a podcast. The whole point of this podcast is to be objective. Some players are good, some players are not, and I'm going to state that clearly. So I don't know. I don't know exactly what the best path is other than to try to uh, recognize humanity a little bit better. I certainly have never been and never will be that kind of person that does things like sends death threats or anything personal to a person, you know, at, at off the field type stuff. I mean, they're, they're human beings. I get that. But um, maybe trying to find a way to, to illustrate that a little bit better on the podcast. I don't know. I don't exactly know. But again, it, it just causes you to kind of stop and think a little bit for me, especially having, you know, I mean, you, you guys, I mean, everything you put on social media is there and you can maybe go back and delete it or whatever. And we all kind of go through it, but, but it's a little bit different here because I'm asking thousands of people to listen to the sound of my voice and listen to the things that I've said. And those things are out there. And I, I'm, I mean, I suppose I could delete it, but I'm not going to go back and comb through episodes and everything. But what I say is out there. And, you know, who knows? I mean, it's, it's weird to think about, you know, <laughs> this is a weird thought, but something I've, I've thought about is, you know, for, for me and for people my age and, and older or whatever, and even younger, when you think about your ancestors, it's, it's almost like, it almost felt like for everybody, there's a certain point at which you don't know your ancestors, right? You've met your grandparents, but your great-grandparents, there, there's, I don't know any, I, I mean, I knew them as people, but there weren't a lot of pictures of them, for example, when they were younger. There's none. It's crazy to think that when, you know, you think about how many pictures my wife takes of my kids, it is, it is like 17 a day on average, Right. I mean, we have to buy her new phones because she runs out of space because she refuses to move or delete or anything because she's scared they're going to be gone. I bought her a Google phone because it comes with like free cloud storage. She refuses to put them over there because she's scared of what's going to happen. So it fills up her phone anyways. It's it, the amount of pic. But the point is, at some point, likely, one of my kids will have descendants. They will have not only kids, but grandkids, great-grandkids, great 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 to think that at some point somebody's going to be able to find maybe hundreds of pictures of their great 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 grandfather you know baby pictures and and all kinds of stuff where they lived and you know videos and just all this stuff and for me potentially my great 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 grandkids are going to discover this podcast and be able to listen to it and be like oh dude check this out you know, my great great grandfather was a Packers podcaster, and here's what he had to say about you know, and you can track the historical record. Like, have you heard about Aaron Rodgers? Where, yeah, actually, you know, imagine if you found out your, uh, I guess it would be you know probably somebody that's potentially still alive, but your your great great grandpa actually had a podcast, and he talked every day about Bart Starr and and Vince Lombardi, and you could hear on a day to day basis going through all that different stuff. How crazy that would be! The stuff that you say. And it's, it's true for me, but it's also true for you in social media, carries a historical significance and a weight that we don't think about very often. You know, and that, that is part of the reason why I try to, you know, Packernet After Dark has gotten a little bit more, you know, I don't really bleep stuff out because it's, you know, whatever, it's after dark, I'll leave it alone. But that is a big part of the reason why I have tried to keep this family friendly and everything else. I, I don't want to have a podcast that my kids can't listen to or my great grandkids kids can't listen to or or your kids can't listen to it's, it's just it seems unnecessary but it's not just bad language you know there, there's also again just what you say about people and how you treat people i guess so don't expect broad sweeping changes i i'm, I'm just saying it makes you think and and you know i i, I, I don't want to put a disclaimer every time i 
tell you that somebody's not a good football player, that by the way, I think they're a great human being, but, but I don't know. I, again, I don't know what this means. I'm just telling you where my, where my head is at. Um, and anyways, for that reason, I am going to postpone laughing at the enemy. Um, I am going to resume it. I don't know what the point of postponing it is. If you're going to resume it, all I know is I'm just not in that headspace right now. And it is a headspace thing to genuinely want to do it. And I don't really want to do it. I don't feel like pulling receipts and saying, ha ha, you said this and you're a stupid idiot. We'll get there, but I'm, I'm not, I'm not there. So I wanted to change things up, focus on the Packers, focus on data and information, and um, perhaps as the week goes on, and, and who knows, maybe I'll just skip it. I, I don't want to skip it, but maybe I will. Maybe we just won't do it this week or, or whatever. But um, again, I just wanted to tell you where I'm at at this point in time. And obviously it, it goes without saying, but I want to make sure that it's said. We're absolutely praying for Damar and for his family and, and uh, the situation and just hoping, hoping, hoping for a positive resolution here. Because, I mean, it's, it's so scary to hear the things and you try not to think what you're obviously thinking, but clearly when you heard some of those updates, you thought this is not going to end well. Um, and so it is promising to hear the the last that I heard was some somewhat promising uh, update, and so I'm hoping, you know, even though he may be in critical condition, if if they can just get him stabilized, I know that that region. Um, I went out to Ohio for training, and I didn't realize how heavily focused it was on the medical industry. That's that's what I was going there for, is uh, to learn how to work on cath labs and whatnot. And uh, there's a ton of hospitals out in. Uh, this was actually in, in Cleveland, but, you know, obviously we're talking about the same state. It's somewhat down the road. Point is, it's, it's, it's a very, very good place for uh, hospitals, doctors, medicine, and I'm sure he's getting the best possible care out there. And like everybody else, just hoping that uh, hoping he pulls through and, and hoping that uh, he'll be okay. Also very good to see that his, uh, a lot of good came from that, that toy drive. Um, if you hadn't seen, he had started something, and it was it was almost kind of sad because he's obviously not a superstar player, right? So he starts a toy drive, and, and at first, I mean, there was a few thousand dollars in there. It wasn't anything massive, but he's a football player. He's trying to use his platform to do good for kids in need, and, um, you know, there just wasn't a ton of support. But it's, it's, it's nice to see everybody kind of rally, and, and last I saw it was like three and a half million dollars. I think I checked it yesterday when I first heard about it. It was, I want to say like 20000 And I was kind of surprised it was so low. I, I donated a couple bucks, but um, it must have just caught the right people at the right time because it just blew up. I checked it later and it was over a million. And now now today it's over $3 million. So anyways, the, the only other thing I want to add, I should probably just leave it there and move on. I do want to add one other thing. Just in, in the theme of trying to focus on um, being better, it seems to me there is this thing, I don't know if it's just a social media thing or if it's just how people are these days, probably a little of both. Maybe it's always been this way and social media just makes it worse. I don't know. But there is this notion that the more outraged I can be, the more angry I could be at any little thing that is even perceived, whether I have good information, good reasoning, it doesn't really matter because what matters is my intention and where my heart is. And my heart is filled with hatred for people who are not quite in lockstep with the situation. There's a feeling that the worse I treat people that do something wrong, the better of a person I am. And I don't know where that comes from. But allow me to promise you one thing, that's incorrect. And although you may be getting all the pats on the back and the praise from, from the lynch mob, who want you to act that way, I promise you, that is not what makes you a good person. And it's always sad when things like this happen and, and social media always turns toxic and it's always assumed that it's the people that, well, that it's the people that say the wrong comment that makes it toxic. No, it's, it's mostly the reaction that makes it toxic. The comment, everybody privately looked at it and, and thought, that's probably not the right thing to say. But it's the spiraling and it's everybody competing to be the most outraged and to be the most angry, it's, it's, you know, those people will sometimes show their inboxes and it's filled with um, people saying, I want you to die. I hope you die. That's 
toxic. My wife and I are still watching that um, Married at First Sight. Very stupid show, but it's something. It's not as bad as uh, there's another one where blind something or another. That is that is just, I'm shocked at how normal the human beings are on Married at First Sight compared to that show. I couldn't even get through it. My wife and I, we can't even get through it. It's so bad. But anyways, there, there was, you talk about toxic, man. You ever want to feel good about your marriage, go and watch that show because you realize human beings are just psychotic in general and you put them together and it's just, everybody's just oil and water. But anyways, they, uh, there was this scene where the two couples, I don't know, several seasons ago, but they went to a NASCAR race or whatever. And the one girl, she's very out there. She doesn't really, she's just off the cuff, doesn't know what she's doing, a little, little loopy. But the guy is trying to give instructions and she's just talking and talking and talking right over the guy. Like he doesn't even exist. That is, in fact, disrespectful. However, her husband, actual married husband, looked at her and said, can you just shut up for 15 minutes? Can you just shut up? I promise you, because his heart was in the right place in terms of uh, caring about being respectful to the speaker, that does not make him a good person. He made a bad situation significantly worse, and what he did was actually worse than what she did. And the desire to for some reason, no matter what's going on, form lynch mobs and find anybody who is slightly out of step or anything that might seem incorrect and to fly off the handles with rage and hatred because somehow we think that that makes us seem like caring, compassionate people is the craziest, most insane thing I've ever seen. I also heard the reports that the NFL wanted to push the game and and have them start again in five minutes or 10 minutes or whatever. But the amount of people that lashed out at the evil organization, these heartless, careless, evil Roger Goodell and and these rich, careless psychopaths. And there's no reason to believe that it was true. It's completely unverified, uncorroborated information. It's now coming out that they're saying that was never a consideration. They never, at any point, planned to resume the game. We were going through the process of shutting the game down, and there's a lot to do, and we went through that process, and this is how long it took. And I don't know that that's true. But again, the desire to lash out, and every single time I see it, I, 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 it's almost every time the reaction in my mind is always significantly worse than the initial comment. And then seeing them parade around as though that makes them good human beings, they feel so good about themselves, and watching everybody come around and pat them on the back and tell them how good they are. It's really kind of sick. And, and to be honest, the other thing that I think is, is how selfish it is. Because a lot of it is, look at me. Look at how outraged I am. Look at how much I care. Don't do that. The best thing you can do is to be quiet. If you can offer care and support, do it. Do it privately. Do it quietly. You don't need to show off how, how loving you are by going on social media and threatening people. And calling people evil. And yeah, by the way, probably shouldn't say dumb stuff online either, which again goes back to the original point. The best thing you can probably do is to be quiet. You don't need to go online and say praying for Hamlet. Just do it. Go on there and get into fights with people. I don't understand that. Just if you see something that isn't right, let it go past you. You know, it's like uh, you go to a funeral and somebody's being too loud and it's, it's somewhat dis- You know, they, they show up and they're wearing pajamas and They're being disrespectful, and that's someone you love laying in the casket. There's going to be a desire to lash out. That's the wrong thing to do. It's the absolute wrong thing to do. That place could easily turn into everybody screaming and yelling and swearing at them. You disrespectful POS, get out of here. You get into a fist fight. You drag them out by their hair. How much worse did that funeral become? How much more disrespectful was that, that last moment on earth for that person? Because you can't control yourself. Because you can't just sit there and remain quiet. Just be quiet. People are going to say things they shouldn't say, and they're going to say a lot worse things than whatever it is that made you angry yesterday. And I'm not the greatest at this either when people say things that I don't like. I'm just telling you, don't do that. Learn to be quiet. I know there's no point in me even saying any of this because, I mean, there's, there's billions of people that are causing problems. But it's just, it's just a personal thing. It's, it's not about making my existence on this planet better by cleaning up Twitter one person at a time. It's just these are personal introspections. They're good for me. I tend to think they'd be good for you. Something I think you should think about. Something that I need to think about. Sound good? All right. So um, 
Why don't we do this? Let's take a break now, and then uh, we can come back after the break. And just try to focus on some numbers and some data, some good stuff. And um, another thing that I think I'm going to start doing, we'll see how this all unfolds, but there's a bunch of different ideas on how people want me to sort of review the game. And there's a bunch of little things, which is nice, because it's kind of an overwhelming process to go play by play. So maybe I'll take it a question at a time. So for example, let's go through and look at Christian. So we'll skip all the defense, we'll just do offense, and we'll just look at play by play Christian Watson. We can do the same for Wyatt, but we can do it, you know, on a different day or whatever. So um, I don't know. We'll we'll try some different formats, see what feels good. Might even do some today. We'll see how this goes. Honestly, it's whatever I feel like right now. <laughs> but we'll take a break. We'll be right back. Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard in your entire life? of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have, because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots, where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple. Just whip out your phone, do a little beep boop bop boop. That's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place. And you can get the app and try it out for yourself. So go ahead and test drive U.S. Cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days. That's U.S. Cellular, built for us. Terms apply, awards based on open signal, independent data. So go to uscellular.com for all the details. I want to tell you guys real quick about our new sponsor, Factor. Factor makes delicious, ready-to-eat meals, and they get sent right to your door. They have 35 different options every single week that you can choose from including keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and more. And there's even more to enjoy with over 55 nutrition-packed add-ons that help make your weekly meal planning even more delicious. There's no prep work. There's no messing up six different bowls, mixing stuff. Factor meals are 100% ready to heat and eat. No prep, no cook, no cleanup. Factor is also very flexible with your schedule. You can get as much or as little as you need by choosing between 6 to 18 meals per week. You can also pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. Factor is less expensive than takeout, and every meal is dietitian approved. So head to factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 and use code packdaddy50 to get 50% off. That's code packdaddy50 at factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 to get 50% off. Supposed to be moving on, but I had one more thought on this, on this topic. I was listening to the Aaron Rodgers thing talk about it, and... Um, I think I kind of figured out why I don't want to do the whole laughing at the enemy, at least at this time. Probably don't need to overexplain it any further. However, figured it out. He was talking about how, you know, you you might have animosity towards certain players and dislike of this player or this team or whatever, but that all kind of goes away when this happens because it becomes sort of this brotherhood of people that are football players. And I kind of feel like that's true for us as well. I can't stand the Vikings, the Bears, 49ers, et cetera, et cetera right? Don't like them. I quote unquote hate some of those players. When I say that, I absolutely don't. It's just an off the cuff thing. But I I, I genuinely dislike watching some of these players succeed playing football. And that goes with a lot of other fans too. But when something like this happens, all the fan allegiances go away and it becomes, in my mind anyway, some people maybe don't feel this way, a larger collective brotherhood, whatever, of fans all kind of rallying around Buffalo, the team, the player, everything else. And it would be weird as we all collectively, as one um, collective family of football fans, gather around. It would be weird for me to walk across over to where the Vikings are and start swinging. You know what I mean? Now I'm that awkward guy causing problems. Anyways, that just... Just working through, like, because I don't fully understand exactly what's going on in my own head. But when he said that, it just kind of clicked. Anyways, all right, let's, uh, I want to, I've already kind of said a lot of this stuff. I said it yesterday on uh, Packernet After Dark, so you can find some of that there in terms of some of the interesting things I found on uh, DVOA. Um, Packers, number one team in football over the last three weeks. Small sample size, but it's after our bye week. Kind of giving some some credence to the idea that um, 
even if we aren't actually the number one team, certainly in the belong in the conversation of playoff teams somewhere, wherever you rank us as, as number one, number five, number seven, number 15. How many teams get in? 14? Like half the league, basically. I think there's seven, AFC, NFC, which actually, funny enough, the Packers would not be able to get in if it wasn't for that extra spot in the playoffs. They also wouldn't be able to get in if it wasn't for this extra week, which are a couple of things that were just added in the last couple of years. We would have been big time eliminated <laughs> a long time ago. But anyways, I did have uh, Mr. Numberman, who um, I'm slowly becoming him. I'm, I'm clearly not him, but um, slowly becoming him as I become more and more obsessed with data. But every time I bring up 2010, I can be assured that there will be a message in uh, my inbox on Patreon, very upset from Mr. Numberman, which is actually funny enough. Uh, so it's, first of all, he gets very upset because the general narrative... And I, 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 again, when, when I say it, I'm talking about perspective more so than reality. But the, the very real reality is that the Packers were a very good football team the entire year in 2010. It's not true that they were a bad football team that got hot at the right time and won a Super Bowl. And I, I just went back to double check that on DVOA for the Packers in 2020. And we, and, and we can do this first half, second half, very, very different. In fact, let's just do it. I, th- I think Todd would be, uh, Todd Numberman, be very happy if I put this to bed. In fact, that's deliberately, specifically what he asked me to do, um, and he asked me to do this regularly. Let me let me just read his message that he sent to me. Please shut down this 2020 or 2010 BS comparisons. The Packers were the number one NFC team in the regular season and number three in the NFL. The 2010 Packers did not get hot at the right time. They were good all, they were so season. I'm guessing that's all season. Just like the 2022 Vikings and Packers record in close games was crazy lucky based, just bad luck for Packers. The Packers were mediocre frauds, meaning the Packers were an excellent team. One couldn't tell by their record. Then he goes on to tell me that he does daily word searches of my transcripts and loves the feature. (laughs) There was another, what, what was the word he kept telling me I used so much? And then I started getting self-conscious. Now I already forgot, so I probably use it a ton. But he would, he would message me like daily about how, how my usage of that word was, uh, he was proud of me because the word was coming down over time as he kept reminding me about it. Anyways, let, let's compare really quickly the difference uh, between this year and 2010. So if you look at the first half of the season, weeks one through nine of 2022, the Green Bay Packers, via their DVOA, ranked 17th with a negative 2.8, which is to say 2.8% worse than an average football team. Their offensive DVOA, they ranked, uh, bruh, where are they here? 10th. I had it upside down. I was like, why is it all the way down there? But it's 10th. They ranked 10th uh, with a 4.2% DVOA. And then their defensive DVOA, the Green Bay Packers ranked 17th with a 17 which is actually to say 1.7% worse. You want negative when you're talking defense. The worst and biggest upgrade, perhaps, in the between the first half and second half of the season, the Green Bay special teams ranked 29th with a negative 5.3 DVOA. In the second half of the season, weeks 10 through right now, the Green Bay Packers are the sixth best team in football. Second half of the season, San Francisco, Kansas City, Buffalo, Detroit, Cincinnati, and Green Bay. Top six teams. I know. Hey, Detroit's fourth. We're sixth. They're better than us. We should be scared. I get it. That's where the home versus away thing kind of comes in. Plus, it depends on what week you're looking at and all that kind of stuff. But whatever. Those are the next best teams. And Philadelphia is one right after. I'm sure not having a quarterback the last couple weeks has kind of hurt. And actually, the last several weeks, even uh, with Jalen, you look at how they played the Bears and everything. It's kind of like, what's going on with the Eagles? They're not just like burying teams anymore. Um then Dallas, then the Steelers, Chargers, Jacksonville, blah, 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 all the way down the line. Minnesota, third from the bottom, Chicago dead last. I think I pointed that out before. Okay, but let's look at 2010. Is this the same thing? Did they just get hot at the right time? 2010, second half of the season, week 10 on. Uh, let me get rid of the wild card. I don't know if we even, we must have played in the wild card, but let me get rid of it because obviously I don't want that. Um, third best team in football, second half of the season with a 27 DVOA. New England and Pittsburgh were one and two. First half of the season, weeks one through nine, the Green Bay Packers were the fourth best team in football with a 24.1 
DVOA. I'm pretty sure that's higher than it was in the second half, if I'm not mistaken. I didn't write it down. I don't remember. So that's the point. And the reason Todd gets so upset about it is because it sets an un, a, a, a sort of an untrue perspective about the way things work. Like, hey, we were a bad team then and won the Super Bowl. Why can't we be a bad team now and win the Super Bowl? They weren't a bad team then. They were a great team then. They were a dominant team, and they were a dominant team all year. Not that that necessarily has to be a part of it. It's just a reality. And if you look at it again, they, they were essentially the opposite of what the Minnesota Vikings are. The Minnesota Vikings right now, again, second half of the season, third worst team in football, yet look at their record. And they're even winning games still. But look at the games. Look at the quality of the opponents. Look at how well they played against those quality of the opponents. If you look at the Packers, they beat the Eagles 27-20. They stomped out the Bills 34-7. Then they lost to the Bears, but only by three. Then they beat Detroit 28-26. Then they lost in overtime to the Redskins and then lost in overtime to the Dolphins. That was followed by beating the Vikings 28-24, beating the Jets 9-0, beating Dallas 45-7. That was the first half, and then we had a bye week. We come out of the bye week, stomp out the Minnesota Vikings 31-3. We lost to Atlanta, but only by three points. Then we beat the 49ers 34-16, to lost to Detroit 3-7, to right? Super not impressive to score three points, but still a four-point loss. Then we lose to New England, it's a four-point loss. We beat the Giants 45-17, to and then we beat the Bears by seven, 10-3. So there were several games where it's like, what the heck is going on with the offense? Nine points, three points, 10 points. But still, when we won, we destroyed teams. When we lost, it was by a very slim margin. And when you factor in that luck factor, it's one of those things where there's a couple, there's several things throughout a game that if those go one way or a different way, the Packers could easily have covered that and won the game. It, it's within the luck factor. And so that doesn't mean the Packers are guaranteed to win. What it does mean is that they were a really, really dominant football team the entire season. They were really, really high quality and they won the Super Bowl because they are amongst high-quality teams, they belong, and one of those high-quality teams is probably going to win. Being a high-quality team doesn't guarantee you win, but not being a high-quality team pretty much does guarantee you're not going to win, which is why we know when you look at the playoffs, Vikings fans can be excited about their record all they want, but if you want to know who's going to win the Super Bowl, you look to the teams that are actually playing really, really well, and that's not the Vikings. It is the Packers. It is the Lions. The, the, the biggest issue with the Lions, and this is true of the Packers too, just to a lesser extent, is they don't play, they, they play like garbage on the road and they're going to be on the road constantly. And that is a concern for the Packers too. You'd have to look at their ability on the road. I don't even know if I were to run the numbers against the Vikings if we beat the Vikings on the road. Probably considering the Packers are like sixth and the, you know, Vikings are, they, they suck. <laughs> and actually for the entire season, is that right? The season? That can't be right. For the season, the Packers are the third best team in football? No, that was still 2010. I didn't update it. They're 12th for the season. But even still, as bad as they were, to say this is the 12th best team in football, they were ranked 8th last year. 2020, they were 3rd up to this point, again, through the season. The problem is that was because they were by far the number one offense, but they had the number 17 defense, which is which is problematic. And again, this this is... This is what I was talking about in terms of the Green Bay Packers and why you can feel better about this than in prior years. Not saying you should necessarily. I'm saying there's a reason to. The Packers historically, when they're good, they're the 2020 Packers. Dominant offense, but below average defense. 17th and special teams, 25th. That's the problem. The Packers right now, again, over the last... Let's, I, I don't know. I don't remember. Half, third, what? We're talking roughly top 10 offense, top 10 defense, top 10 special teams. Arguably top 10 offense, top three defense, and number one special teams. It's just a better overall team. It's a, it's a better team is what it is. The offense isn't as good, but the team is better. Less just blatant, horrific weaknesses. Again, looking at uh, the Green Bay defense, uh, well, over uh, 2021, they were eighth, right? Which is nowhere near as, first of all, slightly overrated, right? We thought we were way better than a lot of these teams, and they were ranked eighth. This is just for the season, not necessarily the second half of the season. We can get into that in a second. 
But okay, you're eighth. You're top 10, better than this year's Packers, who are 12th, right? Well, they were eighth because their offense was the second best in football with a 24 DVOA. Where was the defense? 16th. Where was special teams? Dead last, obviously. And then you got the flat-out fraudulent 2019 Packers, right? Well, they, for the season, ranked ninth, despite being, you know, their record being, like, maybe the best. They ranked ninth. I mean, the top team was Baltimore with a 42 DVOA. We had an eight. San Francisco, 32. New England, 32. New Orleans, 31. Kansas City, 29. Then you drop all the way down to 18 to Dallas, 16 Minnesota. Then from there, you drop all the way down to nine for Seattle and then eight for Green Bay. I mean, we we were... We weren't in the same atmosphere as Baltimore, San Francisco, New England, New Orleans, Kansas City. Those are, they're on a different tier than we were. But again, ninth, but as usual, 10th in offense, 15th in defense, 18th in special teams. That was a more complete team in terms of not having anything 30th. But the defense, again, is right in the middle. The offense was barely top 10, and special teams was subpar again. So kind so in reality, this is like the 2019 team if the 2019 team was just kind of a lot better. But what if you look at these uh, these teams in the second half? What they had become. 2019, they dropped from ninth place to 14th place. They were getting worse in the second half of the season. They were ranked 13th on offense, 15th on defense, 16th on special teams. Again, across the middle, they were they were average, average, average. And, and overall, where were they? They were average. With a 4.3 DVOA. What about 2020's second half of the season? They actually were third. Why? Well, again, number one offense, but kind of barely. They had a 34. Tampa Bay was pretty close with a 33. The difference being, defensively, they were seventh. We were 12th, right in the middle. And then special teams, we were 29th. 29th. One of the worst in football. And then if you look at 2021, last year, second half of the season, the Packers, fourth best team in football, which is awesome. But again, what's the problem? Number one by a mile offense, 36.3. The offense was freaking humming. Second best team was a 26, which is Kansas, Kansas City. 10% better than the bet, second best offense. But where's the defense? 16th. Where's the special teams? 29th. 2022 Packers are kind of in that mix. They're sixth. They're, they're right in there with 2021, 2020, 2019. Well, not 2019. They were, they were garbage second half of the season. But, you know, the, 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 with the last several years, we're in that mix in the second half. A little bit lower, but ninth-ranked offense, 16th-ranked defense, third-ranked special teams. I know, the de- I thought the defense was good. Just give me a second. So we're in that line, right? Top 10 offense, middling defense, but the special teams is way off, right? Usually we have garbage, and now, now it's number three. Well, that's kind of crazy. But if you, if, you com- if you look at it even closer, and the, and the Packers are good at kind of getting hot at the end of the season because every year there's a little bit of something, but nothing quite touches 2022. If you look at the last four weeks, so we're talking a quarter now. So we went for whole season, half season. Now we're looking at quarter of a season, roughly. 2019, they jumped up to seventh. How? Well, 17th ranked offense. 4th ranked defense, 18th special teams. Remember, 2019 was weird. That's why like, I thought they had a good offense and a bad defense. 2019 was one week they'd win because the offense would kill it, but the defense was trash. The next week, the offense would fall apart and the defense was good. But again, what do we got going into the playoffs? Inconsist- like Really good defense, trash offense, trash special teams. 7th overall. What about 2020, which most of us think was our, our best actual real shot? Third overall, second in DVOA on offense, eighth on defense, but 24th on special teams, right? So we've got, we've got uh, top 10 defense, top three offense. The problem is special teams is garbage. 2021, ranking fourth, 33.4% uh, overall. Offense ranked number one. Defense, though, 22nd, special teams 30th. How do you win with that? What about 2022 in the last quarter of the season? The Green Bay Packers, number one. 10th-ranked offense, third-ranked defense, number one special teams. 13th-ranked passing offense, 6th-ranked rushing offense, 4th-ranked pass defense, 11th-ranked rush defense. The worst part of our team, in a sort of macro sense, is our passing offense, which is above average, 
It's a 15.2%, which is 15.2% better than your average passing offense. It ranks 13th. So anyways, I, I'm, I'm not trying to necessarily convince you that this is our best shot or this is the best version we've seen. The, the problems are real. And Aaron Rodgers even acknowledges, like, look, I'm not playing my best ball and, and the passing offense isn't its best. Obviously, the wide receiver situation, we all love Christian and Dobbs and and, and, you know, even Lazard and Cobb, uh, to some level, are very reliable in, in certain capacities or whatever. But we acknowledge it's not where it should be. Much better with Devontae. The whole nine yards don't really have any tight ends. I mean, we have tight ends we can rely on a little bit. You know, if you package them all up as one. Um, they're, you know, I, I love DeGuara as a blocker. I love Mercedes as a blocker. Um, Mercedes gets you that one tricky reception about 75% of the time it's a touchdown, but he gets you that one tricky reception every single game. Um, Tunyon occasionally shows up for a touchdown like that one time last week. I think the broadest thing that I'm trying to convince you of and, and honestly trying to convince myself of is that at the very least, they're in the same category, in some ways better, in some ways worse. <sighs> Nobody ever calls me, and all of a sudden I'm getting lots of calls here. Anyways, apologies. It's a downside, I guess, of doing the podcast at night as opposed to early morning. Nobody's awake early in the morning to call you. But anyways, the Packers are not fraudulent playoff team. Now, we, we have to see. We don't have a lot of time. That's the thing. Like It's such a compressed thing. We haven't had a whole season to kind of get an identity of this team. It's a new team with a new identity, and especially the defense. I'm, I'm getting little trickles of things that are different. I saw Dara. Um, I bookmarked it here. Dara had made a one of the, the the posts about one of the changes. It says, the Packers defense has called either cover two or cover six on 45% of snaps since the bye week. Compare that to 11.5% before the bye week. Big change, a lot of deep half zones being played. So cover six is, I'm not I'm not a film guy, so this is not my thing, but I understand where cover six comes from. It's, it's, it's essentially a combination of cover two and cover four, right? Cover four would be four safeties, each covering a quarter of the field. Cover two is two safeties, each covering half of the field. So when you have cover two, which is one guy covering half, and cover four, which is two guys on the other half, four and two makes six. Even though it's three, but you can't call it cover three because cover three implies kind of equally distributing, and this is not that. So it's cover six. But that's kind of the point, is you have two halves of the field. The, The weird thing to me is, my understanding, which was flawed, and it's my fault for not just checking in on these things because I can, my confusion is Dara telling me that we only played cover two, essentially, on 11.5% of snaps, cover two or cover six. I didn't know that because my understanding is the um, defense that is dominating and sweeping the league is a cover two defense. And my understanding is that is a Vic Fangio type of defense that not only is the NFL adopting, but the Green Bay Packers specifically brought Joe Barry in to adopt. Now, again, this is not my lane. Maybe I just completely missed the mark on what it is we were doing here, but this is my understanding. We were running a lot of cover two, or, or uh, perhaps Tampa two, but still, it, it's in that family. And I'm just learning now that that's not the case, and apparently we switched to cover two more often. You know, 45.7% is not even quite 50%, but... I guess I'm saying I'm just a little bit lost in terms of, hey, we switched to start doing this thing that we were supposed to be doing the whole time that everybody else is doing and dominating, uh, but we haven't been doing for some time. Uh, I don't I don't know. There's a lot to delve into there. I want to start at some point looking at some of the coverages and things, trying to figure out the best way to go about looking that up. Um, but... I, I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. But anyways, they are making changes. And, and the good thing about the changes is that it gives you something tangible to hold on to to say that this is real. If nothing changes and you have a good day, it's just a good day, and there's every reason to believe you're going to regress back. There needs to be something tangible that happened that made you better. So in a way, this Lions game is important for, for more than just getting into the playoffs. That's the main reason why it's important, but it's like anything else. It's like I said with the, with the Vikings in this last game. I, I ran through in detail the expectations of a team that is a 12-3 and three football team. 
let's say Vegas is wrong about them. Okay, fine. Generally, these teams win by, what did I say, 10 points, 12 points? Okay, so that's sort of the standard for teams of your caliber just looking at record compared to teams of our caliber just looking at record. However, when you look at Vegas, what is the precedent for that? For, for you know, they run all the details of the team through an algorithm that is much more complicated than DVOA and have come to the conclusion that we should be three-point favorites. You could even look at DVOA, which says that we should be uh, win by four, at least the way that I ran it. I mean, it, you figure out your own thing, but roughly four points better. So again, it just kind of came down to what is your theory and then put it into practice and see how it pans out. If this is real, if this is a tangible thing where the defense is now officially this, 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 although again, you got to leave room for variance. You know, the Vikings are frauds. However, they beat the Bills. Why is that? Stuff happens. That's why. That's why over a longer period of time, you can get to see the pattern a little bit better. But, but generally speaking, if it's real, we should have some level of expectation. If it's not, we should have a different expectation. We'll see what happens. Is this a team gen- uh, genuinely with a top 10 offense, a top 5 defense, and the number 1 special teams in football? Is that what we're going to see Sunday night against the Detroit Lions? A good, competent, but not elite offense a stifling, suffocating defense, and a special teams that's basically cheating because we get to start at midfield and they have to start at the 20. Just cheating with that special teams, man. It is not fair, and I apologize. Forget the refs. You guys are always talking about the refs are always cheating in favor of the Packers. That's been disproven a billion different times by me. But you know how we're cheating right now? Because we are cheating. Well, there was, there was another time the Packers were cheating. Uh, that was that whole thing with the offensive line. <laughs> Basically, they were masters at holding, which David Bakhtiari was a part of, and I believe still does. There was a funny, uh, David Bakhtiari actually posted a clip on his Instagram, and it was him up against Zadarius, and I think it was kind of a shot across the bow at Zadarius. But the funny thing is, you can see his like fingers underneath the shoulder pads, and he's just kind of grabbing his shoulder pads. That's, that's the technique. That's what they learned. Grab and hold those shoulder pads. You just got to know to you know let go at the right time, otherwise you're going to get called for holding. But you can hold as long as, you know... They're not trying to get by you, and you're kind of grabbing and pulling. Anyways, the special teams right now that we have, that's cheating. And I love it. I love it. That's what special teams is for. You get one chance to cheat. We're going to start you at the 25, but we're going to see if you can get lucky and and get something else. And if you're really, really good, you might even get seven points and not even have to put your offense out there, but that's probably never going to happen because nobody's that good, man. That doesn't happen, especially for the Packers. Their special teams is always trash. Just straight T-Rash. But I think that's going to be one of the areas of focus for me this week is, okay, we have a theory that this is where the team is now, and it's a drastic shift. The problem is it's a smaller sample size, so it could be uh, untrue. So what are the tangible things we can look at to say, here is what's different, here's why, and it's why we should believe that it's real going into Sunday and hopefully into the playoffs. And then again, and I know it's becoming tired, but I, 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 I want to go back and look at the offense. You know, one of the questions I think JJ asked it, and I thought it was uh, very well phrased. He said, uh, Jair grade in a review of why the offense feels so clunky. They barely punted. They put up four offensive touchdowns. They ran the ball well, and yet they felt borderline incompetent. Why? And that is the point. And that's part of the reason why I'm I'm hammering this. Look at what DVOA says. Look at what they're saying. Look what they're because it doesn't feel like it. And maybe defense and special teams, but offense. I'm telling you, it's a top ten offense, and it's like. And PFF is at Aaron Rodgers at about 10th, which again, 10th tenth isn't great. It's top third, but even that is kind of like, yeah, maybe, I don't know, kind of, eh. but it's true. I mean, look at how many points they scored. Even if you remove the two, the special teams and defense, it's still 27 points. That's a lot of points. But my biggest fear going in is, man, this offense just isn't moving. They're not, they're not getting it done. Well, they are though, but why doesn't it feel like it? So I do want to look at that. That's what I want to look at. I just want a, a zoomed out picture because the other concern is, you know, is the defense leaving people open? Are they making mistakes? And Cousins just had a garbage day, right? Oh, there's a guy wide open over there. And there's a, I saw some people posting screenshots of just completely locked down defense. Like, yeah, Jair did a good job, but look at the, across the field. Nobody, there's nowhere to go. So I think that's it. I, I, I think there needs to be, and, and yes, a uh, uh, laughing at the enemy will be coming. We're going to do it up. Like I said, which just, it's just temporarily postponed. Um, but I think that is, that is the, the, the point. Because, again, I'm going into this saying, we got the Lions. 
that's a done deal. We're, we're a better team overall. As far as I know, better offense, defense, and special teams. When you're talking Detroit away and, and Packers home, especially, it's not even close. It's not even close at all. Then you're talking about Green Bay Packers, Aaron Rodgers in December. Don't lose. Packers Sunday night, there's a massive premium. I told you that what the I think we scored like 27 points against the Bears last time, and that was, that was a lot of points. But the expectation I had was about 34 because that's the precedent they had set. If you look, I think that was like the lowest scoring Sunday night game the Packers have maybe ever had, which is insane to think about, but it's 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 a reality. On Sunday night in Lambeau Field, the Packers eviscerate people. So I'm looking at this. I'm saying, Rodgers, Lambeau, December, Sunday night. And then you just look at the quality of the teams. And, and again, depending on where you slice it, if you look second half of the season, Detroit's better than Green Bay. But if you look, you know, zoom in a little closer to the, the last quarter, it's Packers above Detroit. And then again, the home away thing, the Packers are, are infinitely ahead. There's a, there's a lot of reasons for confidence. But, but the problem is all the input... Right, garbage in, garbage out. Is is I want to examine what I'm putting in to make sure that it's good information going in, so I get good information coming out. I need to know that this really good defense and really and, and really decent offense and and psychotically good special teams. That's a real thing, and and if we can establish that, then we know it was good information coming in, and all the information coming out is high quality. Again, that doesn't account for any given Sunday necessarily but it gives us a good baseline it's it's it, it almost functions like a handicap the packers should win by 10 which by the way i think i promised you today i was going to give you my score prediction and i don't think i've done that yet but um you know if, if the packers should should win by 10 based on all these factors and they're very good factors it's it's in my mind it's like a 10 point handicap can they overcome that of course they can but it's but there's a comfort level to know that we've get we we get that 10 point handicap all right, so here is the score predictions that I got, again, using my new revised uh, DVOA thing. And I, I actually want to dive in more on this. I'm, I've got some fun ideas because they talk, they look at, you know, uh, passing and rushing and all those kinds of things. And I, I want to examine all of that. But for right now, and this may be modified depending on what I come up with, we've got um, a couple different scores. And again, Green Bay down to the tenth of a point I have exactly. They're scoring 30.2 points. The two different score uh, scores that I have for Detroit, 22.7, so we'll call it 23-30. The other one is 19.4, we'll call it 19-30. to So 23-30, to 19-30. It's a 7-point and an 11-point um, victory. And I think last I saw the Packers were 3-point favorites or 3.5, 4, something like that. Let me check. Yeah, they're 4.5-point favorites. So I already took the Packers in that. I'm comfortable with it. I don't know if the line's going to move from here. Uh, it may be more favorable. It might be less favorable, but I wanted to lock that up because I'm comfortable with it. I also took the over in this game. Uh, it's kind of close. I probably shouldn't. I probably shouldn't uh, dance with things that are kind of close to where I have it, but both of my predictions go over 48 and a half. Um, the lowest that I have would be 49.7. The other is basically 53. So I'm going to go over on that. But anyways, um, might as well leave it at that for now, I suppose. I'm pretty excited, I think, tomorrow. And again, I want to kind of do the 50-50 thing. So tomorrow, maybe we'll do a little laughing or some other kind of thing. But also, I want to mix in some of this film review type stuff. So we'll see how she goes. You guys have yourselves a fantastic day. I will talk to you tomorrow. Have a good one. <laughs>